I hope you've had the opportunity to take a look at the text that we've put up on Plato and Aristotle, or rather by Plato and Aristotle. Both of these are pretty short texts, and they're from other larger works. And in fact, in both cases, at least especially in the Plato case, he's not really thinking about time. He's not really talking about time. And with Aristotle, he's interested in physics. He's interested in many things outside of time or in addition to time. And yet, Plato and Aristotle very much develop some of the themes that we're going to be thinking about all the time throughout this course. And so I'd like to talk about them a little bit because they're ideas that work so well if we're thinking about Hinduism or Buddhism or Newtonian time or quantum time. These same kind of ideas work very nicely. So let's start with Plato. In Plato's Republic, he has a little one-off line that I think is one of the most important things that he writes. Let me read it to you. Only philosophers are able to grasp the eternal and unchangeable. And those who wander in the region of the many and variable are not philosophers. So very typical of a philosopher, he's setting up reality into two groups, philosophers, non-philosophers. And the philosophers and the non-philosophers do different things. We see right here that philosophers can do something that non-philosophers can't do, and that is to grasp the eternal and the unchangeable. Well, what's cool about this is these are questions about time, or they're ideas about time. If something is eternal, it's outside the region of time. It's outside the experience of time. If things are unchangeable, well, then we don't know if time is affecting them or not because we can't see any sort of change. So Plato is giving us this idea that philosophers, the people who really understand the world, are trying to grasp those things that are outside of our regular experience. Now, Plato goes on a little bit and he says, philosophers who are grasping the eternal and the unchangeable are also grasping some other things. They're grasping absolute truth, wisdom, beauty, goodness. So the most important things in life, the most important things in reality for, for Plato are these things, absolute truth, absolute wisdom, perfect beauty, perfect goodness. And he says on there that these are eternal, immutable, and inexorable truths. In other words, they are not varying from generation and corruption. That's his term, not varying from generation or corruption. Or from our point of view, these are absolute ideas that time cannot affect. So if they can't affect it, there's a way in which these ideas of truth or wisdom or beauty or goodness are outside of time. In fact, the things that are perfectly outside of time, Plato says those are the real things. The things that aren't real are the things we see us around us every day because those things are changeable. Those things are mutable. Those things are not outside of time. They're inside of time. So truth and wisdom and beauty are outside of time, and he calls those things forms. As opposed to the shadows of truth, wisdom, and beauty that are inside of time. So we'll get at that more in just a few minutes. Then there's the problem of the non-philosophers. That's most of us, right? Most of us are not the great philosophers. We're not contemplating the universe. So Plato asks a question, or, or gives us the answer to the question, what do non-philosophers do? Well, they wander. We can call them the wanderers versus the philosophers. And where do they wander? This is beautiful poetic language from Plato. He says, non-philosophers wander in the region of the many and the variable. They wander in the region of the many and the variable. In other words, non-philosophers like us live in the world inside of time. We live among things that are not absolute, but are, they're changeable, they're relative. We live in the world where money means one thing to one person, another to another. We live in a world where uh, one thing's happened at one moment and another thing happens at another moment. We feel like that's reality. But Plato says if we were actually philosophers, we would grasp the idea that that's not reality, that the, the region of the many and variable is not real, it just seems like it's real. So part of Plato's question is, how do we move from being a non-philosopher, a wanderer, 
into being a philosopher, a person that can grasp the absolute, the eternal, and the immutable. He does this so, through a very famous idea called the allegory of the cave. And I'm sure you've thought about this in other places. You've probably read it a hundred times in different classes. But let's think about the allegory of the cave, Plato's allegory of the cave, from the point of view of time. So you remember how this works and you read about it. There are some people that are chained in a cave. They are back in that cave. They're chained to the cave. They can't move around. They can't see very much. And more importantly, they've always been in the cave. And their parents were always been in the cave. And their parents were always in the cave. And they, across all these generations, were always chained up to the back of this cave. Now, when I learned this, my first question was, how do you get to have generations if everybody has been chained up to the back of the cave? But that's a whole other issue, isn't it? So for me, uh, this idea is very important that every generation, all of the memory, all of the knowledge of these people are stuck in the shadows of this cave. So they're looking out of the cave. They can't see really what's going on. But what they can see are the shadows of the real things. Because there's a fire past them. And that fire is throwing light onto different objects. So what the people in the cave see is not the actual object, but rather the shadow of the object. And because it's a fire, the shadows are changing. They're flickering. Sometimes they're darker. Sometimes they're lighter. But imagine if you had always been in that cave and all of the generations preceding you had been in the cave. In that case, the shadows would seem to be reality because you don't know any better. Everything that is a shadow would look like the real thing. So when you saw a chair, for example, or a pot, maybe, or a jar, or even a person, all of those things wouldn't be real. They would only be shadows. And remember, if we go backwards to think about what are shadows, shadows change. And so that means shadows are inside of time. And if they're inside of time, they cannot possibly be real, right? Because what is reality? Reality is truth and wisdom and the things that don't change in time. So our life is the life of the people in the, ca in the cave. It's the life of seeing shadows of things that are kind of there. It's not that they're gone. They're really there as a shadow, but they're not the real thing. So then the next part of the allegory of the cave talks about a person who breaks free from the chains and he runs past whatever the thing is in the shadow and he gets up into the, into the, uh, the light of day and after his eyes sort of you know, uh, adjust to having light for the first time, he realizes, this is key, he realizes that everything he saw before were just shadows. He has moved from being a wanderer, which is funny, right? It's ironic that the wanderers actually are the ones who are chained up and can't move, but we won't ask Plato about that. Rather, he goes from being a philosophical wanderer to being a real philosopher because he sees things the way things really are. He takes away, or he moves away from this idea of seeing the shadows as reality, and he sees that what is real is truly real. And those truly real things don't change. They make no change. He sees the forms for reality and not the shadows of reality. So let me give you another example of this idea of form. Take the idea of a chair, right? We know what chairs are. You sit down in a chair, you get up from your chair, you have different kinds of chairs. In fact, I'm always uh, uh, tickled, I giggle a little bit when I'm driving home in the afternoon because I go by this rather odd store that sells furniture. And in the front of the store every day, they have these three huge ladies' shoes, big pumps. One's purple, one's black, one's pink. And these big shoes are actually chairs. And so they hope that somebody will come in and buy this big woman's shoe and then use it as a chair. So think about what that means. We see it as a woman's shoe, a really big woman's shoe. But we know somehow that that's a chair. Plato asks, how do we know that's a chair and not a big woman's shoe? He know, we know it because we have in our heads, in our sort of shared memories, we have the idea of chair, the perfect chair, the ideal chair. 
or maybe even to think about it from his, using his words, the form of a chair. So we have that in us already. Even when we're born, we have this idea of chair. And so we can go around the world and we can see things inside of time and we can compare those changeable things, an office chair, a pump chair, a beanbag chair that doesn't look like anything, all of those things we can understand as chairs, even though we know that they're really only shadows of chairs. But that's a little weird, right? Because if it's a shadow of a chair, why can we sit on it? Well, we can sit on it because everything around us is shadows. And we don't know what true reality is because true reality is outside of time and we're stuck inside of time. So for Plato, the important thing the true reality, the wisdom, the beauty, the things that he cares about as a philosopher are those things that exist outside of time. They are the forms outside of time. And everything that we think is reality is actually not reality, but rather it is the shadow of reality. So that's pretty weird. And in fact, it was pretty weird for Plato's uh, great, wonderful student, Aristotle. And Aristotle, being, of course, the student of Plato, needed to accept Plato and accept the things that he, he did, because after all, how would he pass his course if he didn't agree? But on the other hand, being a very good graduate student, uh, Aristotle wanted to go further and look at different sorts of things. So Aristotle does something different. He says, fine, Mr. Plato, you are the man when it comes to outside of time. You are the one who explains to us what reality is outside of time. But you know what? You and I, Mr. Plato, and everyone who comes before us, and everyone who comes after us, we're stuck. Here we are inside of time. So what do we do? We have to figure out what this thing is and what life is like inside of time. So Aristotle basically says, great, Plato, now you've given us reality outside of time, but we're going to now think about what reality is like inside of time. Plato would have said, well, I'm going to fail you for that because nothing is important inside of time. Aristotle says, no, 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 no. I'm going to teach you, Plato, that the things inside of time are important, they're understandable, and if we can understand those things inside of time, ultimately, that will help us to understand the things outside of time. Aristotle gives us a definition for time that Plato had, Plato had not. Plato didn't care about time. He didn't want to define time. But Aristotle wanted to define time, and he defined time in a way that is very useful for us. He said time is the counting of the before and the after. He didn't really say it that nicely or that easily. He said it is the number of movement in respect to the before and the after. But what he really meant here is that in order to have time, you have to have three things. You have to have a before, you have to have and after, and you have to have someone who will notice the difference between before and after. So to think of it even a more simple way, time is simply change that we see or change that we experience. So in order to have time exist, we have to have something happening before. It has to change so we know that it's after, and we have to have a human being in there to count all of the befores and the and all of the afters. So if we look at the picture of it, when we think about it, we might think of Aristotle's time as being time in a line. Before, after, before, after, before, after, before, after. Every time there's a before, there's always an after, but that after is before of some other after, right? It gets very confusing. But it makes sense to us because time is moving from one set point to the next one after it, and then the next one after that, and then the next one after that. And what Aristotle gives us is a structure of time, an arrow of time. He gives us the idea that time is moving from the past that we can understand into the present, which is already gone, and then from the present into some future that we can't yet really understand, but we desperately want to know about. Plato says, who cares? All of that stuff is inside of time. Aristotle says, I care because I can understand how things work inside of time and that will help me to understand the truth and the beauty and the wisdom that Plato wants us to see outside of time. And that makes sense in a way, doesn't it? Because if you think of outside of time being 
bigger than inside of time, then outside of time includes inside of time in some funny way, right? The next question for Aristotle is, great, what do you do? We're inside of time. We agree that that chair really is a chair. Sure, Mr. Plato, you can call it the shadow of a chair, but you know, I'm still sitting on it. So we'll just say that the stuff inside of time is real. Plato then develops an extremely, incredibly, I think this is important, uh, unbelievably important set of uh, steps to understand everything that's inside of time. And I mean everything. Physics, biology, philosophy, theology, zoology, all of the ologies that we have in our universities, Aristotle said everything within the human experience and the natural experience can be understood using a four-step process. We call that the Aristotelian method, or we call it the Aristotelian science, or we call it the Aristotelian um, way of thinking, or sometimes we might even call it the, the Aristotelian paradigm, the way that Aristotle understands the world. Here are the four. First, observe the world using your senses. So if the sun comes up and the sun goes down, we realize that the sun has come up and it's gone down. So you make as many observations as you can. Step one. Step two, apply logical rules to those observations. Now, Aristotle, because he was a really smart guy, developed a very, very wide and very deep set of rules. We're not going to worry about them now. It's not important to our understanding of time. But what's important is he had logical rules that you could apply to any observation, any situation. So again, that second step is to apply logical rules to your observation. But different people can have different ideas about what those logical rules are or are not. So Plato says that the third step is always to go back and to consult past authorities. This is key for us when we're thinking about time. Because, I think I said Aristotle, or Plato, but I meant Aristotle. Because Aristotle says, look, if you have gone through a logical system, we can then look back and see what really smart guys have said about that same idea. And if your idea and the other smart guy's idea from the past if they work together, if they agree with one another, then you can go finally to step four, which is conclude. So to say it again, you start off by observing the world, you apply logical rules to your observations, you consult past authorities to see if your logic fits their logic, and only then can you conclude. But imagine what this means for us when we think about time. It means that we have to look backwards in time for our answers. We don't look forwards, we look backwards, and this makes sense because for the world of Aristotle and Plato and for, in general, the classical world, people assumed that human beings before us were smarter than we are. So they assumed that people knew more and we are slowly forgetting things. So the idea here is that if you look into the past, you're more likely to get the truth than if you just care about your own senses or your own observations or your own logical rules. We've got this really interesting setup, right? We have, on the one hand, Plato, who says, let's study those things that are inexorable, immutable, and universal, the things that don't change and therefore are outside of time. Aristotle says, eh, why don't we study the things inside of time? And here's the four-step logical system to study things that are inside of time. And if we can get what happens inside of time, we might be able to make broader generalizations that would help us to understand things outside of time.